Man, what an honor, Ed. Great to be here, brother. I love you. Oh, I love you too. Thank you for that. I, it's, you know, I, I meant that on the stage. You just spoke to my group at our big mm -hmm. event and I wanted to pour into you. Mm -hmm. It's one of the best things I've learned from you is you say, let me tell you about you yep. and you pour into people. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I've started doing that and it changes everything it in the relationship. Yeah. Well, it shifts your connection with them. I said this when I was speaking, truth vibrates at the highest frequency. So when you tell somebody the truth about them, mm -hmm. now you've changed the entire dynamic of your relationship with them and you can change them. Very few people have truth spoken to them about themselves. Really, most people, I think, have lies spoken to them. You know, I talked about the four lies mm -hmm. when I was talking today, but, you know, really quickly, there's if I'm an adversary and I want to get you to not pursue your dreams or not be happy, everyone has their four Ds. My friend John Gordon has a great list, but mine are the first thing I would do is I would get you doubting. If I can get you to doubt that you're capable or qualified or that you can do it, if I can sow some doubt into you, I got you. Mm -hmm. If it's not doubt, I'm going to get you discouraged because if I can get you discouraged, man, you will get off your game. So I'm going to give you a dose of failure, a dose of setback. I'm going to get someone to hurt you, let you down, quit on you. If I can get you discouraged, you're out. If I can get you delusional, and delusional means you're deluded. You begin to think a problem is much bigger than it's worth. You start what I do, thought stacking, I call it, where you just, you replay the problem over and over again. In our minds, you think, if I just replay this problem enough times, then I'll figure out the answer. Mm. As if the first 60 times you thought about it wasn't enough, right? So you get delusional. You make things worse than they are or better than they are. Mm -hmm. And you get delusional. If I can't get you delusional, then I get you to delay. If I can get you to flinch, if I can get you to wait, I get you to think, man, I need a little bit more preparation. If I just hold off on this for the right time or the right moment. So the four D's of getting someone off their game is they're going to get doubtful. They're going to get discouraged. They're going to get delusional or they're going to delay or all four. And so you flip someone's life over because those are all lies. But you just tell them the truth, which is the, the specific things that are great about them. And you've become incredibly good at doing this. And I'm very proud of you because I think that's what a leader does. I think that's what a good human does. A good father, a good mother, a good friend, a good businessman or woman is they tell people, they speak truth to people. Well, and it's so important the way you said that because you can't just blow smoke up people's skirt. They know when you're doing that, yes. right? Like I remember when we were in your basement at your house out in California and you looked at me and you said, and you looked at the other people in your room and said, if I could get all of you to just do the things that I ask you to do like Jimmy does. Yes. And I'll never forget that because yeah. that is the thing that's helped me to grow my network. Because the thing that makes me stand out is I do say, if I say I'm gonna do something or somebody tells me to do something, if I'm getting coached, yeah. I do it. Well, the most incredible thing about you so far has been your coachability, not just your coachability, but you're coachable at the speed of instruction. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's another thing about success too, is there's a rhythm and a pace and a cadence to it. And most people don't get that. It's kind of like you watch somebody sometimes, they'll come to all these events, read all the books. It's almost like you ever go to a wedding. I'm probably this guy. <laughs> and you watch the guy dancing and he's got the moves, but he's almost like he got the moves, mm -hmm. but he's dancing to the lyrics, not the beat of the music. He's just off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that off a little bit in business is someone who knows all the right things to say. They know the mindset stuff, but they don't understand the rhythm of something. And for you, you're like, okay, I'll do it now. I'll do it now. There's a power to doing something right now that once you don't do that, you've lost the moment mm -hmm. of doing it. You're, you're so good at that. And there's a rhythm and a pace. And what happens is when you have the rhythm and the pace, you create this artificial force called momentum. And momentum magnifies. It can take an average person like me and really allow them to create superhuman results because they've got this force behind them that is momentous. And that's because they're coachable at the speed of instruction, which you are like an all-timer of people I've coached. You go right away. Well, thank you. Well, I'm not going to – I mean, for me, it's – I don't hire these coaches because I want to name drop them. I hire yeah. them because there's a, there's a system to life that I've been able to hack Ed, and you've done this too, but I find out who is where I want to be that used to be where I am. Yes. And then I go get in their world yes. and you are that guy for me. I'm Thank like, you. if I get around this guy for 10 years, mm -hmm. there's no way right. I'm not where I want to be where he is. Yep. Like it will work because I'm just going to do all the things that he did. Yeah. And mainly, and a lot of it is not that I'm a guru. It's that you're learning from mistakes I've made. <laughs> totally. I can save you a bunch of time. There's this great Chinese proverb. I mess it up all the time, but it essentially says, if you want to know the road ahead, ask those coming back. <laughs> it's pretty simple, right? So like, I know the road ahead. I kind of know the mistakes you'll probably make. I know the wrong turns. I know the, the ideas, the, the temptations to spend all the money you're making to show off or to relax a little bit prematurely. And so even the mentors and coaches in my life, they weren't perfect people. Right. You know, I say this all the time. I said it today. You're most qualified in life to help the people or person that you used to be. Yeah. And that's where most people don't really understand their own greatness. They think the mistakes they've made, their, 
divorce, their bankruptcy, their sin, their maybe it's not even any of those things. Maybe it's just they've always been average. Mm -hmm. They think, well, that disqualifies me. When in fact, it's what qualifies you to help other people. You know, I've told you this, but when my dad got sober, I thought many, many times, someone literally saved my family, mm -hmm. like literally changed my entire life. Some precious human did. And I found him. I know who he is now that helped my dad get sober on a night, by the way, when my dad was going to take his own life. Wow. And I've met him and I know him. And what's crazy about it is not only did he change my life forever and didn't even know it because he just did a simple thing, which is told another human, I can help you mm -hmm. in a moment of need, which is what all great people do. But what the most amazing part about it is what qualified him to help my dad was not how perfect he was, you know, the amazing life he had lived. Quite the contrary. What qualified him to save my dad's life was that he was also a drunk addict, a drug addict, mm -hmm. also an alcoholic, also a liar, also living in the shadows. And because he did that and changed his life, he was qualified to help another man who was a drug addict and an alcoholic at that time who happened to be my dad. Well, I've taken that to heart. You know, the, my coaching program, I essentially was on this 10 year journey and mm -hmm. I just wanted to. I thought I was the problem. And so I was trying to fix myself. And so mm -hmm. I went to every conference. I hired coaches. I read all the books. I did all the things. And then once I got to a place where I finally started to realize like, oh, I, I think I actually love myself now. Yeah. I said, wait, I could just keep doing real estate. I could just keep doing what I've been doing, making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But what if I took all of this and packaged it up and I could save people seven and a half years. Yes. I could save them all the heartache, all the pain. I know how to do this now. Mm -hmm. And that's my program. It's a two and a half years of what it took me 10 to figure out. Right. So all my mistakes, they can you know, cut out essentially as much as possible mm -hmm. and get the best parts that are going to help them get that depth. Yeah. Well, what you're doing is you're shrinking and compressing time frames. Yes. That's all it is. I mean, here's the, I was just joking at your event today about how I used to copy off my wife's paper in school. <laughs> and there's this great spelling test story where Mrs. Hansen comes back in uh, one day in third grade and says, well, someone cheated on the spelling test last night or yesterday. And I'm pretty sure I know who it is. And she says, um, we have a problem here that I have um, 11 tests here, but I have two from Christiana and none from a guy named Eddie. <laughs> so I was so stupid. Here's how stupid I am. I not only copied off my wife's paper all of her answers, I copied her name on the <laughs> test and I was outed. But in life, you're penalized in school for doing that. But in life, you can go find people who have the answers to the test mm -hmm. and copy them. Mm -hmm. Now, now, when I say copy them, what I mean is take their information and then make it your own. Yeah. The worst thing I see on social media is people who literally copy, like they just verbatim quote mm -hmm. things I say or somebody else says, that's a little bit cheesy. But when you learn something, learn like I've learned a lot from Wayne Dyer over my lifetime. I learned from Tom Hopkins. I learned from Tony Robbins. I've learned from mentors or names you wouldn't know. But what I did is I learned that information, internalized it, and then made it my own. Rather than copy someone, I always say model them. Mm. There's been many moments in my life where I've asked myself, I'm modeling John Maxwell. I wonder how John Maxwell would handle this. Mm -hmm. And in my own mind, I'll make a decision or, or speak to somebody not as dumb Ed Milet would speak to them, but as my version of John Maxwell would. So I model people rather than just copy them. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Well, and you know, one of the things that uh, when I'm making my content, one of the things that you have the advantage, I think it's why people resonate so well with you is you've really done it. I mean, you have the experience. I feel mm -hmm. like in my life, I feel like I've experienced a lot. Right. So my stuff's unique to me mm -hmm. and I'm able to use my own stories. I, I can't stand speakers that get up and just talk about, you know, the Golden State Warriors or Michael Jordan. I'm like, it's yeah, so cheesy. It's so cheesy. And where's your own story? Right. Like, well, because they don't have it. I know. And so yeah. it's like you became a professional speaker. But the thing I love about you, and that's why I think you touch people so much when you speak, is it's so personal. Because mm -hmm. we all have had that experience, whether our dad was an alcoholic or not. We all have that moment where, you know, you lose somebody or it's like mm -hmm. one last time or one more time or your story with your son when you're golfing and yeah. all these stories that I, I remember them all very well because mm. they emotionally touch you in a way. And this is why it's so important for me to be in the room for these events and why I, you know, brought you in and, and mm. some of these other amazing speakers, because when you're in the room, they're going to hear your story, but what it's going to do is it's going to emotionally touch them about their own life. Yeah. What relationship did they need to go fix? Yes. What person did they need to contact? Yeah. What thing in their life did they need to start or stop doing? Mm -hmm. And that's the whole purpose of being in the room because that inspiration becomes personal for you. Yeah, you people, bro, you're so, I'm just really proud of you. When I hear you talk now, I'm like, man, this man gets it. <laughs> Not that you didn't get it before yeah. we met, but you get it on a deeper level now. And I think that's why all your results have just exploded. But 
people ask me all the time, how do you, what could I be doing to have an effect on people greater than the one I'm having? And you just described it and I'll, I'll distill it down this way. When you're a leader in a company or a parent or a speaker on stage, facts tell, stories sell. Mm -hmm. People remember stories, right? So then you go, okay, I got to tell stories. But to your point about, oh, Michael Jordan did this, or this is a great story about the Warriors, that story doesn't have any real meaning. The best speakers, the best dads, moms, leaders in a business tell me stories with a you meaning. Mm -hmm. Let me say that to you again me stories with a you meaning. So when I'm telling a story, I'm trying to frame it and say it in such a way that you're hearing my story about my son and I, but you're really thinking about your family. Mm -hmm. You're hearing my story about my business failure, or stupid mistake I've made, but you're thinking about your business. So it's telling a me story with a you meaning. Mm -hmm. Same thing if I'm talking to my son, you know, uh, where he's a golfer and, you know, he's going through a mental struggle or something. I'll tell him a me story about my mental struggle in baseball when I was in a slump with a him meaning. Mm. And that's when you've really affected people. And being in the room is different than listening to it on an audio it is. because of the energy in the room, the spirit in the room. One thing, other thing that just blows my mind about people is they're oblivious to the fact that you are literally always making people feel something. Mm. It could be that they're invisible. It could be that you're not worthy. It could be that you don't have a lot to add value to. It could be that you're underneath them or above them, whatever it might be. But you're making someone feel something. Mm -hmm. And so once you realize that, I'm, what we're doing right now, someone's feeling something. So why not have some intentionality about what it is you want someone to feel? Mm -hmm. Because people don't re respond to what they hear or see. They respond to what they're feeling. And so when you become great, and by the way, so do you. So what I'm always asking myself is, what am I feeling right now? Mm -hmm. Because I can't transfer to you authentically that which I'm not actually experiencing. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to give your children a bunch of self-confidence when you aren't experiencing any. It's a very empty transaction you're giving your child. So if you want to be a great father or mother and give your children self-esteem and self-confidence, you need to possess it yourself so that you can give them that gift. If you want to possess strength and leadership, you know, if you want to give that to somebody, you've got to possess it. If you want to really care mm. and make someone feel that you care about them, you have to truly care about them. And the reason that it's so important what you said earlier, I don't want to skip over this of telling people the truth about themselves. Let me tell you about you is once I've told you the truth about you, I've made that deposit, so to speak. I can now challenge you. Mm -hmm. I can make the withdrawal and going, no, this is how great you are. And by the way, you're not living up to it right now. You are not living up to it right now. There's a higher standard for you. I expect a better standard from you. But too many people either A, never told the truth to people mm -hmm. or B, they're always challenging somebody and they've never made any of the deposits. And you wonder why people don't stay with you or they're repelled by you. You have to invest in somebody and say, I believe in you this deeply. Because I believe in you this deeply, I expect this from you. I say all the time with my friends, I don't want my friends to accept me as I am. Mm -hmm. I want them to love me as I am. Okay. I want you to love me. That gets confused a lot these days. Sure because does. You, you know, it's beautiful what you're saying. Well, it's so yeah. accurate. Well, I want you to love me as a brother. Like, man, I love you. I believe in you. But I don't want you to accept me. If everybody accepts my behavior all the time, no one's challenging me. Great leaders challenge people. Great friends challenge one another. They don't judge them where, hey, like, where it feels like you don't love me or believe in me. But if everybody around me is always accepting the results I'm getting, accepting my behavior, accepting my thinking... Well, then we never make any, we don't grow. We don't expand. So I've been blessed that I surround myself with people that believe in me enough, not always to accept my BS, mm -hmm. not always to accept the story I'm telling me about me or the excuse that I'm making. I love when a great friend goes, they listen to me. I have a really, this is a guy that you would know, but he's a well-known actor and made a bunch of movies and he's a great guy and he's much older than me and I love him. And uh, I remember one time I was telling him some story about why this thing didn't work out in business. And I gave him the whole story. And he goes, man, 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 I just love you. I love you, brother. And I said, thank you. I love you, too. And he goes, and that's why I'm going to challenge you on this bullshit right now. <laughs> Here's the truth, dude. All right. That whole thing you just said is totally ridiculous and not congruent with who you are. And you're way better than that. And he just went right at me. But he couldn't have gone at me like that if I hate, if I didn't know he loved me and believed in me. But he certainly didn't accept me. Yeah, I had an experience a couple of years ago, right before the pandemic. It was literally the weekend it all went down. My buddy was getting married out in California. And I was, you know, in the wedding as one of the groomsmen or whatever. And I had 30 of my closest friends out there. And I actually broke up with my girlfriend at the wedding. 
Mm. And I ran my mouth Ed, to every single friend there. And later on, I was, I felt so dumb. I felt so stupid. And I literally talked to my friends. I said, I needed one of you to be a good enough friend to be like, what the hell's wrong with you? Shut mm. up. Mm. You're not this guy. Quit mm. talking about this mm. breakup. I needed mm. one guy to love me enough mm -hmm. to like actually call me on my shit. Yes. And yeah. I was like, permission guys. And mm -hmm. we do a really good job of it now, but mm. my deepest friends, they're the ones that, I mean, they, they'll call me on everything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because, and you know, you've been in this position, you know when everyone's kissing your ass, but you also know the people you can trust. Yep. And when people ask me, they said, how do you network with these guys that are at such a high level? I said, honestly, because they can trust me. Like I will mm -hmm. tell them if they say something stupid, I'll make a joke with them, mm -hmm. you know, we can call each other out on stuff because you don't trust somebody that's always trying to stay in your good graces because they're afraid it's not a real friend they're afraid they're going to lose the friendship if they are honest with you dude you have this has never come on any podcast i've ever done mm -hmm. what we're talking about right now and as you're saying it i'm reflecting on friends of mine whose success peaked and stopped like they climbed pretty high and then they stopped or they went backwards that's, I've said this many times, I have way more friends that used to be rich than actually currently are. Mm. They had it for five years or eight years or nine years and then they pissed it away somehow. And I'm convinced as you said that, cause I was just thinking like, why hasn't that happened to me? And it's because at every level I've gone to, I've been able to add new friends to my circle who mm -hmm. didn't yes man me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people when they get to a certain level, now you're the CEO, now you're the big shot, now you're this, everyone's, yeah, all your jokes are funny now. Mm -hmm. You ever notice that? The more successful I've become, I've become evidently <laughs> way funnier. Because I told the same joke 20 years ago, crickets, now, ah, and every mm -hmm. everything's a yes. And I've been blessed. You know what? It's not just a blessing, it's a blessing, but I've also been intentional about finding people who speak truth to me. And I think a lot of times the higher you climb, it's harder to do. Yeah, It's harder yeah. to find those people who are, because they don't want to lose the friendship with you. You know what I mean? The more you climb, they're kind of on your coattails. Now you're the one taking them to dinner. You're the one taking them to the Super Bowl. You're the one who, when you go out, people know you, mm -hmm. right? And so it's harder and harder for them to go, bro, no, 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 no. So you have to keep finding those people or creating an environment with your current friends where they do do that. Because it's yeah. probably the number one thing that will get you to stop is that you start believing all your own BS and your own stories 100%. and not have anybody tell you otherwise. Well, you see these big CEOs that make horrible decisions for their business or mm -hmm. athletes that do it and you're like, where was, right. who was in the room with right. you? Is there who, a grown up in the room? Who thought this was a good idea? Right. Is there a grown up in the room who <laughs> yeah. went, you're crazy right now, dude. What are you doing? Yes. Right. And I've been lucky enough to have some people, you know, keep me, keep me away from me and yeah. some of the decisions I would have made. But now that we're talking about it, what a huge, like, but someone should do a whole book on that. Like adding You're people right. to your circle, yeah. brother, that are like, Hey man, I'm gonna speak truth to you. Well, and I, you know, I got, you just spoke to a room of 500 of our, you know, my friends and clients and there, I got 10 guys in there that I've been friends with for over 30 years. I met a couple today. And yeah. they anchor me because mm -hmm. I'm still the dipshit that was borrowing their burrito at lunch because I didn't yeah. have any lunch money. Yeah. They don't care. Yeah. You know what like, I mean? Like, and dude, I, I actually know you. Yes. Right. And here's what I tell my friends. Yeah. I'm like, guys, if you're not in the room, if I'm not in the room, you defend me like I'm the greatest human you've ever met in your life. Mm. When I'm in the room, you're a hundred percent honest, no matter what that means. Very and good. that's really how it goes. Like where people make the mistake is they'll shit talk their friend when they're not in the room. Yeah. But then to their face, they kiss their ass. It's the opposite. Yeah. Like be the opposite of that. You know what's funny? Someone doesn't have to be bad for you to be good. Yeah. And I've learned those lessons over time. I tell the, <clears throat> the guys this a lot of times when I'm coaching them and they'll tell me a story of what happened and everything. I said, what if there was no bad guys in this story? Yeah. What if there just isn't a bad guy? What if a bad thing happened, but there wasn't, we don't need to make somebody wrong because of this thing. Brother. And it's such a powerful principle because it changes people want to find a reason this happened to them. They want to find mm -hmm. a scapegoat. They want to they find want to blame. The, yes. They want to blame. And the second you go, what if there just isn't a bad guy? Correct. Because I've met very few people that weren't trying to do the best they could. You nailed Whether it. Whether they can or not do good. Right. And by the way, not everyone deserves to be in your life. I have friends that just can't make good decisions. Yes, right. But they are doing the best they know how. Brother, you're so right. Like this is maturity. Like everyone's operating out of the best they've got right now, the mm -hmm. best information they've got, the most experience they've got. You're so right. Two things on that one there probably isn't always a bad guy it's just two good people making different <laughs> decisions and maybe one of you made a good decision one of you made a bad decision that doesn't make them a bad guy right. and by the way good people do bad things too right i have and so that's that and then the other part of it is earlier when you're talking about like looking at yourself and growing 
I love therapy. I actually promote it on my podcast. I actually have a therapy company that sponsors my podcast. I believe in therapy. I believe in self-evaluation. I believe in self-auditing. I believe it's one of the keys to growth. I also believe one of the things in therapy and, and personal help or self-help right now that's a dangerous thing is something's wrong with me. Mm. I'm screwed up. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. What if the truth is nothing's wrong with you? but that you just want to grow and get better and improve. Why do we have to assess or judge ourselves and go, man, I'm just, this is all screwed up about me. I'm broken over here. What if you're not? Mm -hmm. I'm saying this a lot lately to people that I coach. I mean, what if there's literally, what if really you're great? Mm -hmm. What if really like you're tremendous and awesome, but you've just reached a place in your life where this behavior or this thought no longer serves you, or you've come to an awareness level that it never served you, but that you're not flawed and screwed up and have to be remade. What if you just want to get better and grow and that you've got this internal desire to do it because you can't serve on the level you want to based on where you are currently. But there's this notion of like, I'm screwed up. I had this problem. I'm all messed up. And then you're in this self, you're, you're in such self-evaluation all the time that you never act. You never get out of it. You're always in your head. You're always thinking. You're always finding out what's wrong with you. Man, if I spent all my time figuring out what was wrong with me, I'd never leave the daggum house. Mm -hmm. There's so many things screwed up in well, this brain. I don't of think mind. enough people give themselves grace. Me like, either. I, I, the day that my life changed is when I started going like, oh, I did a stupid thing. It doesn't mean I, whatever. It doesn't mean anything. It means, right. I, made it, it means I did a stupid thing. Right. And it's I, like, I can move on from that very fast. I think after 52 years, I figured out, like I've accepted, I do some stupid things. Mm -hmm but I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good guy. Yeah. Most of the stupid things I've done is just operating out of that current level of awareness that I was in. When you go back to the four Ds, who's sowing those thoughts? Go back to doubt, right? Yeah. Where does that come in? You doubt yourself. You're like, oh my gosh, I guess I can't do this. I'm broken mm -hmm. because of the thing with my dad or my mom or whatever mm -hmm. it was. I was like, mm -hmm. no, like what if you just, those doubts, those aren't serving you, right? Right. right. I love you talked about delay because that's one of the things I, I, I've been talking a lot about this lately. And I think the most successful people have just learned to act quickly. They do. You said it on the stage so beautifully. You said they don't need all the information. They don't. They, and I don't know if that's biological wiring. I don't know if that's it's not. A, you can train yourself you, you, to do you that. You can train yourself to do it. I've done it. Listen, the most successful people have a lower threshold of what they think they need to know in order to take an action. And they have this belief system of like, if I could just get in the room, I'll figure it out. Once I get through that door. And by the way, if you look back at your life, God has done this for you over and over again, that when you've gotten into a situation, you've found your way out of it. You figure a way out. And I have that belief system about myself now that I I will figure a way, just get me in the space, get me in the podcast, get me in the room and I'll navigate it. The other thing I said on the stage that I know you know to be true, once you meet all the successful people, I'm gonna give you a little secret and it's the fact of fact of facts. Nobody knows what they're doing. That's so true. Nobody knows what they're doing at the highest levels in everything. You'd be amazed at what they don't know about what they're doing. And they've just built this confidence, this momentum, this energy about them where they figure things out as they go. Most people have a dramatic overestimation of what other people know or what their abilities are. And when you meet them or you coach them like I do, you will find out all of us are pretty screwed up. Yep. All of us are just trying to figure it out. Yep. All of us don't know what we're doing, but we have found a way to convince you that we do or convince ourselves that we will figure it out even though we don't know everything. Well, the day I knew I could hit high levels in this industry is I got around some of these, you know, influencers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was my takeaway. I was like, they don't even know what they're doing, right. but they're doing so much. Correct. And there's so much honor in that. Yes. And I was like, it wasn't this like, oh, they're idiots. It was like, oh my gosh, that's the secret. Yes. They're just taking action. They are. As imperfect as it is. And so I've started doing that. I've really been trying to teach my team this. I, you know, I had a, my, one of my people that works for me and helps me with a lot of my events. She was a perfectionist on all these things. And I said, hey, I said, I need it done. I don't need it perfect. Like we are behind because, and she was so stressed. She was bawling. And I said, listen, mm -hmm. I said, let me tell you a little secret. I said, these trips, the magic is just the guys being together. Yeah. We can't screw this up. Right. We literally can't screw it up. She yeah. goes, what if, the, I said, let me tell you a little secret. We went to the Bahamas to go swim with tiger sharks, no cage, one of the most amazing experiences of my life. We'll have to go do it sometime. Yeah. I'm going to bring you with me. Okay. And I mean, you see these big tiger sharks come in from the deep blue and it'll change your life. There's an mm -hmm. energetic exchange with you and there's no cage with you and the shark. It's a 16, 17 foot shark and your life changes and you just respect the earth and nature, mm -hmm. the whole thing on a different level. So I'm taking 36 of my guys to do it. It's in the middle of the ocean. You go on a liveaboard, you have to drive out three and a half hours to get there. So 
eight hours before everybody eight lands, hours. I went a day early. The guy calls me, says, the winds are horrible. We can't go to Tiger Beach. We can't get out there. And my other activities were golf, can't do that in the wind. Fishing, can't do that in the wind. And scuba diving, uh, like a reef, mm. can't do that. All four activities. I mean, oh. these guys have taken six days off work. They've all paid me $10,000, yeah. you know, and none of the activities <laughs> I had. And long story short, I end up finding another island. I basically charter a different plane, get us to this other island. We go swim with giant hammerheads, the most life amazing experience ever. Not one thing went right. Like mm -hmm. that trip and everybody's favorite part, you know what it was? Hanging out at the resort, sitting there and having deep conversations. I said, mm -hmm. we can't screw this up. You can't screw it up. The only way you screw it up is by bringing negative energy or stressing mm -hmm. over it. But when you get enough good people together, and that's what I kind of say is like, I'm an alchemist. Like my job is to put as many good pieces together and just let the magic happen. So like bringing you, I wasn't stressed today. Right. I told you this on the stage because I, I'm I got it speaking. Like this can't mm. get screwed up. I can't screw this day up. <laughs> like, you. And I just showed up and I just decided to be here and mm -hmm. I have no negative energy. I have no worries mm -hmm. and it, it, the rest will take care of itself. Brother, I, I, I hope people really listen to this podcast because these are the real things. Like I don't, I don't have everything figured out and I do believe there's just magic in having intention. Mm -hmm. I was young, I've told you this story. I'm, I won my first incentive trip in our financial company. And back in those days, nobody really, not nobody, but I was one of the few people that worked out that was also a business person. Mm -hmm. I remember I read a book called The Corporate Athlete by this guy named Grappel. And I'm like, that's going to be me. I'm going to be an athlete. I'm going to be a corporate athlete, a business athlete. And uh, I, I do take some pride in thinking that I was one of the people that made being in business a physical sport. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, I'm up and I had this thing get up before the sun. So I'm running on the beach in Maui, running down this beach. And there's a guy running towards me. I could see him from a distance, like we're going to run into each other. It's a narrow beach and it's, uh, he's got like a bald head and I can see he's got back hair and he's sweating. I'm like, I do not want to bump into this guy. <laughs> As he gets closer, I'm like, I want to bump into this guy because it was Wayne Dyer, oh, wow. who was one of my heroes. If you don't know Wayne Dyer, everybody Google it. Anyway, he runs by me and I pull off my headphones. I say, Dr. Dyer, you changed my life. And he turns and he goes, I doubt it. He goes, I bet you changed your life, but how did I help you? Mm. And then he walks towards me and we sit down on this beach and for an hour and a half, I watched the sun come up with Wayne Dyer and it really altered my life. It was one of these moments where like God kind of intervened in my life and said, I'm going to send you a mentor. Now I was like you though, you're going to send me this dude, I'm going to be coachable. Mm -hmm. But that day we said a bunch of things, but what I took from the day is he said to me, he goes, Ed, would you do me a favor? He goes, you're going to change the world. Maybe he said that to a lot of people, but to me, he had never said it before. And maybe he had never said it. Sure. I don't know to this yeah. day. He goes, you're going to change the world. And he goes, and it's not because you have this unbelievable ability to communicate because you do. Um, it's not that, or even your thoughts or any of that. He goes, um, you're a good man. You have great intentions. And uh, he goes, if you would always predicate your confidence on your intention and not your ability, you'll never lose your confidence, Ed. But if it's always predicated on your ability or the results you produce, it's going to be, you're going to be chasing that tail all your life. Just remember, you intend to do good, Ed. That's where your confidence comes from. And here's what was crazy about it. I knew that was true about me. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe I was particularly smart. I didn't believe I was a great speaker. I didn't believe I was that great of a businessman. That was hard to convince me. He spoke truth to me about what I knew to be true about me. I do have a pretty good heart. I do want to help people. And everything I do in my career, from speaking to a business meeting, I remind myself my intentions are good. So it's filled me with confidence. And to your point, now I'm willing to step into these spaces, even if I'm not prepared, because I have a lot of confidence in my intention once I get in that space. If I could give a gift to the millions of people that hopefully hear this, it would literally be, man, start to give yourself way more credit for intention, for your intentions than your abilities. If it's always on your abilities or always on the results you produce, what happens when you have a failure? What happens when you have a setback? What happens when you just lose momentum a little bit? You're going to be up and down all your life. The truth is in business, I haven't had that many downs once I got it going. I had a lot of downs in the beginning until I learned this lesson. But once I learned this lesson, I've had some setbacks, but no, so far, thank God, no major stuff happened because I've linked it to my intention the entire time. I had an experience about a year and a half ago. It's so funny that you use the word intention because I, well, in a couple of months ago, me and my buddies were hanging out and one of my friends, my buddy, Jeremy, he says, uh, he was like, dude, I, I, I have these nightmares like that. I don't know if I'm, I'm good with God. And I was like, what, what are you talking about? Like, he's like the best guy. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? He's like, I don't know. I don't. 
And my other, I was like, are you crazy? Of course you're good with God. I was like, what are you mm-hmm. talking about? And my other buddy, Andy was like, well, dude, you didn't know that either. It's in your book. Like that was your struggle was that you didn't know if you were. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is my whole upbringing was like, I didn't know if I was good with God. And there's a lot of pain in that. There's a lot of unmet expectation in that. And it switched for me the day I had this moment about a year, a couple of years ago when I was t- saying, and I had this moment where I was talking to God and I basically talked back to me and he mm-hmm. said, Jimmy, it's all about intention. Wow. What God, what all knowing, all loving father would not honor intention. And this, I said, wait, so the Muslim what? guy that prays four times a day and is dedicated his whole life to God. Of course he thinks he's, or he believes he's talking to God. He's getting that answer. He goes, of course, look at the intention. He said, look what you did to have this experience right now. The amount of, I was fasting. I'd put all this effort Mm -hmm. into this moment to, you know, and I was like, oh my gosh. And then I was like, so the Jewish guy that goes and he does this, Mm -hmm. of course, the intention. And Mm -hmm. what I realized is like, I think the reason I walk with so much confidence and I'm so confident in what I'm doing because it doesn't have to go well. I don't have to win. I don't have to have it go well because I know my intention was good. Mm. And so I'm confident knowing God is like kind of guiding it. And so it all comes back to our intentions. Everything about confidence, like I think confidence is knowing that you're on a path that God honors. I think confidence is knowing that you're doing things that are good for the world. And when you're doing that, you're so confident Mm -hmm. and it all comes back to your intentions. Bro, I well, this last like eight minutes here is like one of the best moments in any podcast ever. Thank you. Mine or anybody's yeah. because it's really true. I was just thinking as you were talking, because I'm so proud of you. Why do I believe in you so much? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> sure. You know, when you, you ever think like, like I really believe yeah, in no, you, I can you know, that. or my son, you know, like I believe in him so deeply. It's because of his intentions. Mm-hmm. And when I think about you, I'm like, what is it that I believe in so deeply? I, I, it starts with. I know you're a good man. I know your intentions. I know when we've talked privately about your group and other people, it's true to you. It's real to you. Your intention is to create change. Then from there, all your gifts are magnified to me. Mm -hmm. Your ability to communicate, your ability to organize events. You are a very creative and innovative person in the way you think. So I can celebrate all those things, but it's anchored. The illumination of it is the intention part. I know you, like I know your heart. I don't think you'd ever intentionally hurt a soul, Mm -hmm. right? Like this is a good man. So I have this massive belief in you. And because I have this major light on you, all your other abilities to me get magnified. Mm -hmm. But if I didn't think everything you had great intentions, it would minimize all those things and I wouldn't see them. Mm -hmm. You just gave me a gift because, you know, my gift is that I see God in people, meaning I see their giftedness. And I'm thinking to myself, why is it that I have that ability? And you just explained it to me. It's because once I assess someone's intention, it allows me to brighten the light on their giftedness. And if I don't sense good intention, then it dims the light on those things. When you look at all the guys that are getting exposed and having issues that are, you know, in the influencer space, it's because they don't have good intentions. Mm -hmm. And when they get exposed, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that I love the most. You mean like if they take advantage of a client or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're they're in it for money. You can, I mean, you can tell when somebody's in this for money. You can tell when somebody's doing it for the wrong reasons. You can tell when their their ego's all over the place, Mm -hmm. you know. One of the things I love is my guys know why I'm doing this. Yeah. You know, it's the advantage that you have, that Andy has. There's only a few. Tom Bill, you mm-hmm. is we didn't have to financially Correct. do this. There's right. no need to make the money doing it. Right. But because we put ourselves in a position, we're able to do it from the heart. Yeah. And it doesn't mean we don't make a shit ton of money doing it. Right. But you don't need to. And that's a so, different energy. It's a different intention that I, you're giving I, it. I always believed that that was one of my big advantages getting into this 100%. space is that I didn't need it. Meaning I, I came to serve and to give. Mm-hmm. In fact, for years, I did it completely for free. And people are like, bro, you need to monetize this to some extent. I'm like, I don't really want to. I got money outside of here. And finally, someone persuaded me that, hey, if you did monetize it, then people will pay closer attention, take it a little bit more oh, yeah. seriously. Took me a while to buy into that. Mm-hmm. And now I do. But even to this day, like I just spoke at your event. I didn't offer anything. I didn't give a QR code. I mean, sometimes I'll do that. But like I never offer anything. It's always to serve and to give first. And I think you are right. I do think it's hard for people who consume entrepreneurial or personal development content. Who who do I listen to? Mm. I think one of the things to look at is do they need me? Mm. You know, are they serving first? So it doesn't mean that someone who's never done it can't help you. I don't I don't think that's true. Like there's some great hitting coaches in baseball who weren't great hitters. Mm. So that's not completely true that if someone's never done anything, they're a no value but it's rare. Mm -hmm. It usually, if I'm going to go to a gym and have a trainer, I'd like them to be fit. 
they have already done it, right? If I'm gonna have a mentor show me how to be wealthy, I'd prefer them not be broke, mm -hmm. right? And so I'd prefer someone to have walked the walk first. Well, was, you know, when I got into real estate, I mean, I did real estate for 17 years, sold thousands and thousands of houses. When I first got in, I can admit this now, I was dangerous because I was hungry as hell and I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know? And I thank God the market covered me because mm -hmm. I didn't put anyone in these horrible positions. <laughs> and, you know, but like, as I got older, I looked at, you know, me at my career now, and if you hire us now, like, oh my gosh, the experience you're going to get is so good because mm -hmm. it's 17 years yeah. of experience behind it. I learned all the mistakes. I mm -hmm. made all those, you know, things. And going back to intention and work, it's the same thing. It's not so much intention, but it's what you focus on is going to determine whether you have success or not. Because if you focus on the outcome, or the result that's mm -hmm. like I look at it as like a funnel that's the bottom of the funnel mm -hmm. and that's where people focus because that's what they want to see that's what they mm -hmm. but you don't control that and all you control is what goes in the funnel so if I stay focused on my intentions on what I'm actually doing the work I'm doing every day no matter what I'm going to do this 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 is if I do all this the result will be there you and just nailed it I got to tell you in this space it's I don't want to say it. I just gotta tell you, when people coached me in the beginning, yeah. I was blown away by, they go, bro, if you do, and they always started back at the money thing first and then worked their way back. And I'm like, that's so creepy to me. Mm -hmm. Like, even when I got into financial services business, back in the day, there were no wires, like uh, ACAs or whatever, like you got physical checks. <laughs> yeah. And I was working at an orphanage at the time when I started my financial business. And I remember my girlfriend at the time was now my wife. She's like, you need to cash these checks I had no money, but I would leave the checks on my dresser. And she's like, it's expired. It's only 90 days, cash the checks. And I'm like, that's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it for this. I was so extreme because I didn't grow up in a family that talked about money or dreams. In fact, my family looked at wealthy people like they probably got it from some ill-gotten means somehow. So like I never wanted to be, I never thought about being wealthy. It wasn't until I kind of got into business, I, I would see how people lived and what they could give and contribute. And, and also like cool things they would do. I'm like, Hmm. It literally was like two years into business. I'm like, yeah, that'd be cool to like not be broke, to like totally not be broke. And even to this day, the greater motivator for me, if I'm you into like my internal mapping, the greater motivator for me was to not be broke, mm -hmm. not, not to get rich. Mm -hmm. Even to this day, whatever I'm worth, it's, you know, in the nine figures multiple times over, I still have this weird part of me, like almost, it sounds like negative, but like, I don't want to go broke. Yeah. I don't want to. And I kind of like that fear. It keeps me humble. It keeps me not being grandiose in my expenditures. But like, if you really want to inside my mind, I'm not saying it's even healthy. I'm not even saying it's right. It's just really true that I'm more moved by avoiding the pain of being broke than I am of the pleasure of being wealthy. Well, I was reading about this actually pretty recently. And if you give people, you know, if you tell people they did these surveys, all right, your life savings on the line, coin flip. If it's heads, you double it, tells you go broke like nobody takes it, right? Mm -hmm. You're all your net worth. They said you had to give people nine times their net worth before mm -hmm. they would flip the coin mm -hmm. because we're so much more prone to not go broke yep. versus getting rich because it's we all have that fear of like, you know, I will say this though, and I think you probably experienced this. I think going broke is such a superpower. It happened to me in the real estate market after, you know, in mm -hmm. 07, 08, because you go to the bottom and you're at this spot. Mm -hmm. And it's not that bad. It's, not, like, that it's bad. not that bad to be broke as long as you keep like every, if you're doing the things, right? It's true. That's why habits are so important because if you get in a bad place, your habits will pull you out. You're right. You know, I had a couple of months back. I just, I went through a surgery and I just wasn't, I had to knock mm. me out two days in a row and I just feel it felt off, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just, some things were going wrong. A couple of things with the women I was trying to mm. date weren't working out and I just was off. Yeah. But I have this thing where I have one of my guys that I coach, a different guy comes every morning, meets me at my house at 7am yeah. and we go for Take a walk. A walk. Yeah. And I had those lined up for the next month and a half. Mm. I had cold plunges lined up where the guys come to my house and we do a mm. cold plunge. I had gym sessions with my trainer set up that we went and did. And it didn't take me more than two weeks to pop out of it yep. because I had the habits in place. Yes. But I think, you know, too often we are so worried about the worst case scenario. And so there is almost a superpower in being a little down a few times and yes. going broke because it's just not that bad. Well, that's the D, that's delusion. Mm. One of the delusional things is thinking how horrible it would be to be broke. This is a delusional thought or like, oh man, my life would be over. It'd be no, you're not. <laughs> I've been broke a few times. And the truth of the matter was, hey, look, I would rather not do it, but I was okay. <laughs> I still found a way to get some food. I still found a way to live. I still found a way my way back. I still have all of the knowledge I've learned. You, you can't take from me this. Mm -hmm. You can't take what I know. You can't take my heart from me. You could take a lot of my money from me, but I actually have this belief. People always ask me, do you think you would get it back? Here's the real answer. I don't know if I'd get all of it back, 
but I'd get a lot of it back. Mm -hmm. Would I go get, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars back? I don't know, but I would get it back. Mm -hmm. And the truth is like, by the way, that stat where you said nine times, it could be 5,000 times and I wouldn't flip the coin. <laughs> right. I just wouldn't. I, I'm really wired. I think because when you're, when you have an alcoholic parent, I think this idea of, I used to worry like, what if it's just my mom and I, my mom didn't have a job outside the home. She was a homemaker. How are we? I think I lived in real fear as a little boy about that. But whatever it is, I've learned to take my wiring and leverage it. So I want to undo some of it, but I've also been able to leverage a lot of the things in my life. And the truth is, like, I'm probably pretty wealthy because I did live in fear of being broke. Mm -hmm. It caused me not to make massive, stupid financial moves. And so all of it's been God's protection. And my friend Jamie Kern Lima talks all the time about rejection is God's protection. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that I've been rejected by in my life were actually God's way of protecting me not to go into business with somebody or not to stay in a friendship with someone. And so it's all it's all sort of divinely orchestrated. And I'm not so I'm not so obsessed with trying to control everything anymore. I kind of like the way the wind blows in life and see where it takes me. And I've got the focus, the confidence to believe my intentions are good when I get there. Yeah. Well, and that, I mean, that, and it shows, you know, one of the things I said to you earlier, again, is you have this ability to convey and to contribute your own confidence to the people around you. This is what yeah. the great war generals do. It's what great coaches do. It's what great players do. They, they you walk in, you go, look who we got with us right. today. We're going to win. Right. Like they we're going to win this battle. Yeah. And I think that is that ability, and by the way, you get that by going through that, by mm -hmm. by living in a little bit of fear for, you know, mm -hmm. for 36 years of my life, I didn't think I was good enough because, you know, mm -hmm. my father had told me something that I wasn't good enough and mm -hmm. I, that's what I heard. And that was my driving force. Thankfully, um, I received the message, this has served you, it no longer does. I was able to drop mm -hmm. that. But it was, it, the message when it came to me, it wasn't, this isn't good for you or this is a bad message. It was, this has served you, it no longer does. Yes. And it's all a gift. And mm -hmm. like, I, it's the number one thing I try to help people understand is like, when you can get to the point, we're in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the issue, you're like, this is kind of cool. This is the gift. Yes. There's no bad days. I haven't yeah. had a bad day in years. I've had hard days. I've mm -hmm. had days that I had to learn a lot, but you're in the moment. You're just like, oh, cool. Like this is all part of it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it really is a cheat code to just having a beautiful life. You're amen. You're right. By the way, I'm very proud of you for saying that because that's exactly how I feel. You just articulated it better than me right there. Well, really good for people. I mean, pretty much everybody listening to this, I'm sure <clears throat> knows about you, knows who you are and everything for the audience. that's never heard you speak live. By the way, you guys, you got to find a, a room. I think he's going to be speaking. You're speaking at Limitless again in April, the event we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. grab some tickets. I'm speaking as well. It'll be good. fun to share a stage with good. you again. Um, you talk a lot about your relationship with your father and we'll kind of end it with this a little mm -hmm. bit, but it's such a beautiful speech that you give and coaching men and women. Mm -hmm. The number one issue I see that, you know, seems to hold people back is, is they do have this father wound or this mother wound or this mm -hmm. thing from the past. And you've just, I asked you this on the stage, but I want to have you articulate it here, but you, you've done such a beautiful job of, you know, you grew up with an alcoholic father mm -hmm. where, I mean, a lot of problems come from that. Mm -hmm. And you've been able to turn that into such a gift, not only the way that your life and his ended, mm -hmm. but just the way that you're able to feel in general, the energy around that. Mm -hmm. I think that is a superpower that you, when you speak, everybody wants to have that experience mm. and they want to have that change. And I think that's why so many people are so touched by that speech. Thank you. Well, for me, well, I'll just, you, you're, if you're asking me like, how did I heal that wound? Essentially, yeah. Yeah. Two things. One, I'm aware of the wound. And once you have an awareness over something, it loses most of its power over you. Not all of it, but I know I've got that wound. And so because I've had that wound, once I start behaving in a such a way out of the wound, I go, I'm doing it again. There I go again. So that's number one. Number two is if you hold on to the emotion, of something you're living in the past immediately. So if there's an emotional charge of something, you are now living in the past. If you, until you release that emotion and create a new emotion, you're in the past. Once you create a new emotion, now you're living in the present and the future. And so for me with my dad, I had the gift that most people don't get, which is my dad did get sober. But in, in his sobriety, I got the answer to your question. If someone didn't ever fix the wound, what happened was I got to know my dad after he was sober, many, many conversations. And what happened is I developed empathy for my dad and love because hurt people hurt people. And I started to hear the stories of what happened to my dad and what caused my dad to act out that way. And it was very emotional for me. And I started to see him as a human and I lost my judgment over the wound he had given me. I lost my judgment. It turned from judgment and pain and anger to grace. Mm -hmm. And, um, it shifted everything in that moment. And so what I would say is if you've got these wounds, one, be aware of them, and two, work at 
losing the judgment, the emotion of the judgment, especially by the way, if someone keeps doing it to you, they've cheated on you or whatever. And like, it just, you keep repeating it and repeating it, and repeating it. You're, you're ingraining in your neurology, that emotion over and over again. But when you release that emotion and change it to something that's empathetic or non-judgmental, knowing what must have, what pain must that person been operating out of in order to hurt me like this? Mm. And so once you do that and you shift the emotional charge to it, all of a sudden now you're in the future. And until you do that, you will live in the past over and over again. And for me, I got the gift that with my dad because I got to see him. But a lot of you won't get that gift of them after their sobriety, after the affair, after they screwed you in business, you won't have that. So you've got to play that out in your mind and start to think to yourself, what pain must they have been in? What would I need to believe about this so that it could serve me? I ask myself that oftentimes, like what would I need to believe about this so that it would serve me? I would need to believe they were in tremendous pain. I would need to believe they were operating out of some system that was ingrained into them. I would need to have some empathy for them. I would need to give them grace. I would need to pray for them. Once you ask yourself what you would need to believe, you can change the emotion. Now you're in the future. Oh, that's beautiful. A question, I, similar one that my coach Melissa would always ask me is, what if that weren't true? What's another possible yeah. thing that could be going on for yeah, them? You exactly. know, it's, it's just another way to look at yeah, it. What but, would I need to believe or what if that weren't true? Yeah. And the fact of the matter is just so you know this, everybody in your life, you were born to do something great with your life. Mm -hmm. You were, you're born to do something awesome. You were born to be happy and anything that's causing you a lack of bliss, a lack of success is a lie. The adversary or the world is using against you. Stop believing those lies. Start to speak truth. The truth is my dad was wounded. The truth is someone hurt my dad. That's the truth. It operates at a very high frequency. And because of that, I've been able to shift that emotional charge. And you can as well when you speak truth to yourself. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, the last thing is, uh, I'm so honored you wrote the forward for my new book. I did. Be one, how to be a healthy it's man awesome. in toxic times. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, it's a needed, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, since please. you're asking me, it's a needed book in these moments in time. There's not one like it. And it's something, it's rare that when a book arrives in culture at a time where the culture needs it, and the timing of what you wrote about, what you do at this moment in time is a convergence of great work, but also great work at the right time. So I'm super excited about it. Thank you. Yeah. Love you, man. I love you, brother. Thank you.